And then again, I, two days in a row. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whenever you are. This is the Community Live Stream. Welcome to the show. This is the show that brings you not only answers to the ServiceNow community, but the thought process, the journey of discovery, the unfolding of adventure as we go through and discover how we get to those answers, the reverse engineering, the way that answer is achieved and the, the discovery so that you can take these types of techniques to your organization and become a more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer. Boy, if I'd been recording that, I would have started over. But this is live. This is all unscripted. This is just for you. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow. I've been here for just over nine years. Been a customer for a couple of years before that. So I bring a little bit of experience to the show and help and share and learn along with you. If I don't learn something today, I'm not doing my job right. So let's get into the pre-roll. If you are watching this on YouTube, thank you very much. You can subscribe to the link that you see there. Don't forget to turn on those notifications so that you get the notifications. I got a Twitch notification, but I do not see the... There's the Twitch notification, and apparently Dave Slush is out of office. But I don't see the YouTube notification. That one showed up like eight hours later yesterday. I don't know what's going on with that. So good morning, Carolyn Ramsport. Good to see you. Carolyn's one of the regulars. She's, she, I think she's got her alarm clock set by this thing. It goes, Brrr. it's 1 p.m. UTC. Quick, turn on YouTube. Go to the community channel. See what's happening. That's where you can go. Or she gets alerts better than I do. <laughs> oh, she's already downloaded and tested out Jeopardy. Yes, the Jeopardy game is posted to the community, to the share portal. It's there with video, with everything else. Hopefully everything works all right. If you spot something in there, of course, that's what the community is about. That's what the share portal is about. Let me know if something doesn't work, if you'd like to see some enhancements made, that kind of thing. I had a lot of fun building it. Looking forward to playing it with our Phoenix developer meetup in a couple of weeks. That's going to be a lot of fun. Shane? Good to see you. Let's continue on. If you're not watching on YouTube, then you're most likely watching on Twitch. If you're not watching on YouTube or Twitch, let me know how you're seeing this, because I don't know. Of course, we embed the YouTube video into the community a few minutes after I stop. I put together the links. Got an app to take care of all of that, a ServiceNow app to handle the links and the production, the post-production. Makes it a lot easier. So this end of it is done all manually with the 10 digits on the ends of my hands. And away we go. So Twitch also has the videos around for a couple of weeks. YouTube will have them indefinitely. That's why I post them there and cross-link them back to the community. So hopefully you've seen that. Uh, otherwise, if you've got a question, you want to give more than just a shout-out like Alan just did. Good morning, Alan. If you want to give a shout-out, if you've got something more, question about ServiceNow, go over to the community, ServiceNow, community.servicenow.com, where you can post your questions, subject matter experts of all degrees, of all nationalities, of all diverse backgrounds can tie into that and do their best to assist you. Not guaranteeing anything will be answered, but we do our best. My specialty is in uh, the platform, custom applications, integrations, that kind of thing. I'm a developer at heart. I like to talk to other developers. I like to talk to you as well, even if you don't consider yourself a developer, but that's the primary audience of this show. And we will go through and find things in the community along that line. If I skip over something, it's usually because it, it's going to take too long and would ma not make for good show content. And I'm making that judgment call on the fly or I don't have uh, the expertise to back that up and I can't contribute. Now, there are times when you post something and I'll come back and ask, what is the business requirement? So if you do post something, pictures are often helpful, including what the business, not the technical requirement. I've had people say, how can I edit this thing in a list? That's a technical requirement. Tell us why you're trying to do that. Understand that. Because if you don't understand, you need to go back to the person making the requirement and understand that. Is it a nice to have? Is it a need to have? I've had a lot of nice to haves lately. People say, hey, how can I turn this thing green? Um, is, that in, is that critical? Because that's a customization. If it's critical to your process, then I'm curious to know more about the process. And you might want to dig a little deeper into that. If it's just a, hey, it, it would stand out better. There's been mistakes made then maybe we can help you turn that thing green without a lot of customization, something that'll hold up in uh, in future upgrades, that kind of thing. But 
That aside, who haven't we said good morning to? Lieberger, good morning, good morning. James is back. Paulo, good to see you all. Thank you for joining me. Let's get on with the continuation of the pre-roll after the community comes. The developer site. So developer.servicenow.com. Reminder, go get yourself a free personal developer instance running Kingston, London, or Madrid. Any of the three latest revisions at this point. Did I mention this is Thursday, June 13th? I don't remember if I said that or not. You can get free learning plans. You can get uh, meetup events are under the events menu. You can see things scrolling by. We've got a YouTube channel full of lots of content, including live coding happy hour, which Dave and Andrew and sometimes me will do on a Friday afternoon. Get together, discuss. Sometimes it's Friday morning so that we can reach the EMEA and India people more effectively before they take off. Because, you know, Friday afternoon is middle of the night for many of you. So live coding happy hour is where we tackle a personal project or something that we're working on and uh, show you the, the, the real sausage making factory that goes on behind that. Uh, it's not a pre can demo. We are working through this. We will scrape our knees and bump our heads and learn in the process and share that learning with you. Sometimes we get to the end of the hour and we accomplish what we want. And sometimes it's, well, we're going to have to hang it up and go offline and discover. So lots of great stuff on the YouTube channel if you want to discover that. As I mentioned, learning plans, you can get a lot of free learning over at developer.servicenow.com to become a ServiceNow developer and hopefully improve your career, take you places you want to go. You, if you're not part of the meetups, go over to meetup.service, excuse me, meetup.com slash ServiceNow dev program. There's the URL right there. And we are over 16,000 members strong. We want to see that grow even more in 2019. And uh, we'll get some more chapters out there. If there isn't a chapter in your area, please reach out and let us know. And we'll help you get one started so that you can get together with like-minded people and discuss ServiceNow development. Yes. After the... What do we have? After meetup comes... Knowledge, that's last knowledge. We're going to skip right past that and go on to the workshop, the, the webinar. I'm sorry, the hot key for that is W. The W stands for webinar. The next one coming up, TechNow, is all about the ServiceNow email client that is available on records. I'll show you that in a little bit, tell you where we're going and what we're going to do with that. There's lots of configuration, and uh, the last couple of weeks, I've really learned a lot about this precious little capability on the platform and hopefully we can enlighten you uh, on ways that you can make uh, be more effective using the email client register at the link at the bottom bit.ly slash tn as in nancy64 reg so register today it's coming up on the 25th that's uh, what about a week and a half away it's the 13th today so that'll be 12 days away close enough week and a half so a week from next Tuesday, as this is being recorded, if you're watching it, of course, plan accordingly. We'd love to see you there. Uh, I'll be doing the majority of the content. Stacy has a quick tip also involving uh, email scripts that you won't want to miss. I, am, I, I know the topic, but I don't know the answer, and I'm curious to see how it's done. So looking forward to that webinar. Go sign up ASAP. Back to... This, any script we write, and I do have script. I was tweaking with, I was, I, was, I was working on something this morning just before the cameras rolled. This will be placed in a GitHub repository so that you can take it and learn from it and shape it and make it your own. Practice on your own instance. Doesn't break anything. This, the, the one that I've got to start with is non-volatile. So I'm not modifying any records, but I do want to get some concepts across that I've seen a couple of times around arrays and and how they're being used and how they're being manipulated because it's not it's not being done effectively and I want to I want to help those who need the help I do have a full excuse me I do have a lot of learning javascript videos in the pipeline right now that I need to finish production on and get those out so that I could just say hey go watch episode 23 uh, about basic array manipulation. So that's where I want to get. Because when I see stuff like this that happens over and over, it's like, I need a video for that, or I'll share it on this video. So watch for that. In the meantime, I'll have a script for you in the repository under today's date, 2019-06-13. 
in year, month, day format. So they sort accordingly and you can just, I know it's gonna be a lot of scrolling. I'm trying to think of how to divide these. May move them into a year so we can have all the 2018 scripts together and all the 2019 scripts. That way, when you look at the front page of, of that GitHub repo, it's not ginormously long. So might do that towards the end of the year. We're getting about 200 folders in there and I don't really care for that much in a folder. It's just a personal preference of mine. Okay, back to the community. Let's get started. Let's see if I can do that again. Where did we go? There, right key. Wrong key. I was already down in the corner. I hit the down, get down in the corner macro. Let's refresh this. This is the community. Again, community.servicenow.com. Good morning, Rushikesh. Hope I said that. Uh, uh, I, I know I probably massacre half the names. I try. <laughs> That's all I can ask for. I tell my kids since the first day they went to school, do your best. And I try my best as well. Let's see. I'm going to start with some unreplied questions in the community. We've got data center for AWS in IT operations management. Not really my forte. Service management. How to create admin approved slash reject workflow, which connects the widget. This intrigues me because these things seem dis they don't seem to connect, but I want to see what the problem is. A widget for hotel request is created after the user submits the request through the widget. It has to go through the respective admin for approval flow. Oh, this field service management is service management. Interesting. So my recommendation, I, uh, while I am not a field service specialist, Specialist, spell it right, specialist. Uh, approvals can easily be done using Flow Designer. In fact, let's go get a Flow Designer. docs.servicenow.com for our documentation. I'm going to get them the Madrid documentation up here, type Flow Designer. And well, it may not get me to the exact right page. Well, that one did. What I often find is clicking anywhere near that, the top, you know, take a look at the categories, click it. And one thing I do like about the doc site is it has this index on the left. And even if I got down here, I could always say, where's the next best place to go? Well, this starts out with Flow Designer. Here's some basics of Flow Designer. Here's creating your first flow. That looks like a great page to introduce somebody to that. So I will copy the link and the page content and put that into here. And we have our first bell of the day. Always the sweetest. Okay, back here, we've got how to access input variables from subflow triggered by parallel flow launcher. Is that workflow or is that flow designer? That's what I wanna know. I've gone through many community posts, did not find the answer yet. In some posts it was mentioned we cannot use input variable in the subflow design SC rec item table. Parallel flow launcher. Okay, we need to be clear about this. I am going to first query, uh, is this workflow or um, flow designer that you are talking about when you mention subflows? Let's get some clarification on that. It's not a question, but it is a response. I mean, it's not an answer, but it is a response. So you get a coin for that. Continuing on, how to retain, well, we're going through them kind of quick today. It's gonna to be a lot of show notes. How to retain the new line carriage returns when pulling data in custom table via UI macro jelly code. Interesting, let's find out what the answer is, uh, what the question is. I'm needing to know how to retain the new lines and carriage returns that are stored in a custom table. The issue at hand, when I enter notes in the journal field, the data is kicked out with the new lines carriage returns removed. Okay, you, if you put that in, this is a test, this is a test, here's another test. That's to be expected. Uh, and then after you get, here's a test, here's another test. What is happening behind the scenes? 
There is a before insert and update rules that is sending the data text to a custom table called UJH Encrypted Journal. Here is the business script. Wow. Okay. So are they getting this via, so short description, oops, I'm sorry, I wanted to highlight the code. That was not possible. We have a business rule that uses an encryption context, gets the display value of the short description, gets the display value of description, and JH notes. Then it set the display value for current, short description, Wait, we just did a get display value and then we're doing a set display value on the same field. Current dot short description, current dot short description. Ah, but they're putting short description set context ID. Okay, so they're encrypting it. They're pulling it out, they're encrypting it. And why not just encrypt the field? I'm not sure what that's all about. If notes is not empty, where did they get notes? UJH notes and UJH notes was came from where the display value of this field there okay so somewhere they have this UJH what type of field is UJH notes it's an incident JH notes element ID is the sys ID Sad that they're not going to get value there. Uh, so context ID insert. Here is how the data appears within the custom table. Value, value, value. Okay. But in the same breath, when I show XML from above, the text is flattened out. Interesting. In order to repopulate the data under the journal field, we're using a macro to pull the data in from. Wow, this is this is pretty deep. Unfortunately, the macro is not retaining the new lines. How would I go about modifying the code? Da, 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 da. Try get value and get display value both do the same thing. Maybe there's a jelly method to get the form. That I don't know. It's an intriguing question. When it comes to journal fields, what you put into the journal field is not formatted text. Okay. It, uh, how it's getting reformatted in that value down there on this custom table, I don't know. Okay. What you put in journal here. FYI, well, I don't have a technical answer for your new line issue. You need to remember that journal fields, oop, let's spell that right, not the Latin way, fields are not formatted text. Uh, I have seen some people customize them, turn them into HTML, but that don't do that. It 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 makes a mess of things. It, it's it's a customization, and I've seen it cause some problems later on. So, don't recommend changing the data type of of some of the built-in fields. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you uh, perhaps you might want your UJH notes to be an HTML field, then save that to your custom table and CC into the, the notes field, work notes field. Was that where he was going with work notes or comments? Or was it notes? It's his notes field. So he's got it as a journal field. Okay. That would allow you to capture the full formatting in your private field, your custom field and table. Then copy the journal content to the journal, the activity history via the work notes. Oops, did I, what did I start that with? Um, where's my comment? Did I hit cancel on that? Reload this page, please. Where'd it go?
Now I have to watch. No. I was watching the replay. I couldn't see what I did. Reload one more time. Subscribe. Where'd my notes go? Let's try that again. The thing to note is that journal fields, sorry about this folks, are not formatted text. How about turning your custom UJH notes? Oh, it's supposed to go faster the second time around, right? Into an HTML field, then CC the content into work notes and your custom table. There's the short version. Reply. There it is. Okay. I'm taking two coins for that one. Let's refresh this. It's been a while. See if there's any new content or some of those ones that I was looking at have been answered. Moving on. Unreplied. Configuration of financial tabs in Project Workspace. Virtual agent. Agent not available. Message replacement. Hi team, we want to replace the out-of-box message display. No chat agents currently available when a user is trying to connect a live agent to the scheduled time. I tried to change the not available message in chat queue, virtual agent, but still showing out-of-the-box message, anything specific available. No chat agents currently available. Whenever I am looking for text, I go to the system UI messages table, which is down here on the bottom, system UI messages, and... No chat something something, right? That's what it said. No chat agents. And I don't have anything. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means there's no English translation in this table. If you watched yesterday, you'll know why that means. What that means. So let's take the original. Sorry about that. Let's take the original message. No chat agents currently available. And first, let's make sure that it's there. So if I go to... Virtual agent. Collab. I don't have this plugin turned on here. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I'm gonna have to come back to that one. Let's go to, oops, the plugin.list. Go to the plugins and turn that on while I go look for something else. So, virtual agent. We have nothing turned on. Boo. Let's turn on virtual agent designer, which is probably going to activate a couple more dependencies. Glad conversation server will be active. Virtual agent web client will be activated. That's good. And I think we also want the service portal one. So, we'll come back to that. How to redirect to other form on selecting an option in current form. What are we trying to do? I have a requirement where I need to redirect the existing form to a new form on selecting an option. This looks like a record producer or catalog item because it's got radio buttons. That's not a native thing. So please select the request type. If I select phone and request something new, then it should redirect the form to other service catalog form. This would be an order guide. So an order guide allows you to stack these things up and say, here's my top level, ask some questions, and I'll present you with more items based on that. So order guide is part of the catalog item. SC order guides, order guide submits single service catalog requests, generates several items. You can have it dependent so that I suggest looking at using an order guide for your initial questions, then it will present the proper catalog items based on the responses. That's exactly what they're for. Let me show you an order guide. Is my plugin activated yet? Yes. Close and refresh list. We'll come back to virtual agent in a second, I hope. So order guides, common one, for order guides would be the new hire. So let's go to new hire. When you hire somebody, they often need multiples of things. 
And the order guide starts out with some description, of course, picture, and some variables. Okay, who's the hiring manager? What do they need? Do they need a laptop? What type of laptop? And based on that, you've got this rule base that says, if I picked standard laptop, show them the standard laptop item. If they picked developer laptop, show them the developer laptop item, and on and on. So when we go to try it, where's the preview item? Never mind. Let's just go to the catalog. Service catalog, search catalog, new hire. There it is. And it's, there's the hello name tag that we saw in the image. When we click this description, it's a little out of format because my font is too large. Then I need to pick, let me back that off. I think it's just wonky formatting at this point. New hire order guide. Here is the order guide. Make that a little bigger again. So hiring manager is me by default. They always assume that uh, the hiring manager is filling this out. May or may not be correct, so you can change it. What group is this person joining? We'll take a look. We'll say HR. Will this be a remote employee? No. What office do they report to? Pick something out of the location table. Will your employee need anything non-standard? Uh, yes. And then it says, what device type? Developer sales? And we'll give them an Android phone. So those are the initial questions. Now we choose the options. And it said, oh, you said they're developer. So here's what I'm going to present. You wanted an Android phone. Here's what I'm going to present. These are the catalog items that are presented. Now you could do this with just one as they were looking for, but uh, catalog items are a nice way to ask an initial set of questions and then get the appropriate catalog items out there. This all goes into one request. So if I need, looks like the only thing mandatory here is on the email account. I specify preferred email address. Um, doggone at example.com. We have creative names here. And then everything else is pretty much done. I can say check out and it allows me to do some line item entry on this. Maybe they're repurposing an old employee's phone. So let's not do that. Let's kill that. And now the phone is gone. So very easy to do, or you can continue shopping, adding things to this request. But that's an order guide in a nutshell. I'm going to leave that one in the cart. Go back to my virtual agent plugins. I was on the right screen. E plugin dot list virtual agent is our chat bot and let's go to virtual agent i want the service portal piece service portal widgets active so that i can test this out sure we'll load some demo data i want to reproduce what they're working on i pre mario would myself <laughs> good morning everyone checking in from three lakes wisconsin jay is not in chicago There is a remote possibility I will be at the Wisconsin Snug. We're going to have a discussion on that today. Find out if the uh, if there's content that I can contribute. Love to see some of my friends that I worked with all those years ago. Uh, where was I going? Virtual agent. So I want to go to service portal. And what I need to do first is the service portal configuration to put the virtual agent widget on the page. So let's go to designer and uh, I'm not in the right scope. Am I, I am not in the right scope. Got to be in global to modify the main service portal page. So do that, do that index page done. And the chat was it virtual agent, virtual agent service portal widget. You can quite literally put this anywhere you want and it's going to end up there. So apparently it's already there. Works fine for me. Can you try it from the preview page? Let's go to the preview page and activating the plugin automatically put it on there. So I should see, please stand by while you connect to an agent live. 
I'm just gonna try routing to an agent. Obviously there's no agent there and I wanna see what that message is. Now, do I have in the messages table, let's go back here, order guides messages. What was that message they were looking for? No chat agents currently available. This looks like it's on mobile, so I'm probably not gonna see it via service portal. No chat agent percent. That means starts with, if I can hit the percent key, doesn't say it right there. So back to here, routing you to a live agent. It's still waiting. I'm not sure, but I think this ends indefinitely. Might get a different message on mobile. I could also try connecting to that through my mobile device, see if I get that. I wanna see the message first. While we're waiting for that to time out, let's go back and find one more before I go on to my deep topic. Got one thing in the inbox that I'm tempted to look at. Uh, virtual agent, agent message on replacement. Let's see, I, I'm, I've already got this one open. I am going to respond to this. I'm, I'm looking into this. Did a timeout yet? Did a timeout yet? Did a timeout yet? Not that one. That one not, not timed out. Okay. Uh, have you checked for this message under, you know, it might not even be labeled that. I'm looking at it kind of wrong. I looked in the key, didn't I? Yeah, that's not what I want. I want the message. So the message, no chat agents. Okay, so it's not there. The key may or may not match the message, especially if you're dealing with a different language. So how to, where was I? Virtual agent, this one. Uh, have you checked for the message under system UI, uh, system UI messages to see if there is a record that has a message field with that value. If not, try creating one with a key that says no chat agents. Is it all caps? It was currently available. Not sure if that matters or not. Chat agents currently available and put your text in the message field. See what happens and let us know. So even if there isn't a translation, you can always make your own and it will replace because it'll say, hey, go get the translated text. It goes, oh, the translated text for no chat agents currently available is, sorry, no one home or whatever you put in there. I can't even get that message. So it's a bit difficult for me to reproduce this. I'm gonna back off of that and go into our deep topic. The deep topic, maybe I should have <laughs> theme music. Okay, our deep topic today comes from this particular post. This is the second time I've seen this happening. I'm not picking on anyone's code. They got the answer right, but unfortunately Nog out here is going to not learn JavaScript correctly from this example. So he was trying to write a reference qualifier, an advanced reference qualifier. And this kind person came up with this code, albeit a little oddly formatted, but hey, look, we got colors in the formatted text now. The, um, the challenge is we've got an array of ref titles, which came from, I don't know where, ref titles. There's not a var, re a, I don't see where ref titles is coming from. You sub, oh, he's passing it in as a parameter. Sorry about that. I did look at this earlier. Ref titles is here. And is that an array already? If so, why are we putting it in square brackets? So some comments here would be nice about what the input parameters are for this qualifier. Uh, the, there is a usage up here in get titles of class manager, director. Oh, it's a string. Okay, so already things are a little wonky. You can't just throw a quoted string into an array. I, I honestly don't know what's gonna happen to that, but we can try. The, the next thing I see is we're taking title array and setting it to string and then doing a split on comma. How is that helpful? 
I mean, what what are what are we accomplishing here? So things are things are out of sync. Let me back up. I have written a simple little script, and I'm going to take it one step at a time through script's background. What he's passing in is a string. So over on my personal developer instance, I have script's background, which is a very helpful testing ground. You can also use um, Explore by James Neal from the Share Portal, if you like, for many of these things. A little handier. And I've built a string. Is that my 150? Yeah. Okay, let's put that away. We don't need that. We can make this. Uh, can't make it any bigger. I'll lose my run script button. But I've got a simple string that has five comma separated values in it. Pretty straightforward. It is a simple string. Never mind the commas for now. It's just a string of characters. And if I output that, it's going to say, what is the value of that variable? And what is the type of that variable? I use the type of a lot when I'm confused about things not going right. Like, oh, I'm dealing with an object instead of a string. Let's convert it to a string or let's convert it to an array or let's do what we need to do to get this right. Okay, so I run that and it says, this is a string, here's what it looks like and it is of type string. Now, going to the second part of this, let's include this. I'm going to introduce the split operator. It takes my string and one of the things you can do with a string is split it. And this split is a comma. Now you'll notice that in, oops, in this example, it does a split, but it's after it's converted to a string. Well, what was it before? It was an array. So we're converting an array to a string to split it. Why not just take the original string and split that? So there's some extra steps going on here that just don't need to happen. So here is my attempt at a shorter, more concise thing. If I can find the window. We take the string and we split it and we should get a list. Now I am printing out list equals and just saying print the array, which will visually look like it's doing what it's supposed to do, but it is not. If I do this, it says it looks like the same thing. It's automatically putting in commas for you. That's the default separator when you say print an array. It says, okay, I'll put them in. But notice now the type is object. Arrays are objects. So keep that in mind also. If I had simply done this, gs.info list, the reason it's, it's, it's adding those commas is because it's saying, you're starting with a string, I'm going to turn this into another string so that you can see it. So there's an implicit two string going on here. But if I don't have that implicit two string, because there's no other strings in here, it's going to say, same thing. It's going to add an implicit string. I honestly thought it was just going to say object. So never mind. So what is Chuck going on about? Well, let's go one step further and take my list back to a string. Because right now, the second one is an object. It's an array. Great. It's an object, it's an array. If we do a two string on, on an array, it will bring back a comma separated, just like I said before, only this time it's not implicit, it's explicit. So we're still getting visually the same thing, but they are not the same thing. We got a string, an object, or an array, and another string. So how do you, once we've got this array called list, let's take it one step further. Okay, go through the list elements. For var i equals zero, start at the zeroth element, i less than list.length. Okay, go until you get up to five, then quit, because it'll actually quit after four. i plus plus, arrays are zero through n elements, where n is the length minus one. GS info, let's print out i equals, we can do the index. Actually, you know what? This would be a good example to do a for each. Let's do a for each on this one. For each, uh, item in list. And you gotta do this, I'm sorry. I am doing this wrong, wrong language. <laughs> list.foreach. 
item. Now I can say GS info item. Let's get each individual item out of there. Do that right. I don't use for each's all that often, but it goes, no, you're missing a semicolon. I think it's gotta be a function in there. Ah, uh, I gotta look, gotta look at some notes real quick. Hold on. For each. There it is. I want an embedded function. I want to be able to see this screen. There they are. Arrays, basic arrays. Yep, it's a function. Okay. Pardon me. Function item. And I also need to close out my function thingy. So do I have these matched up? They're fun. There we go. Chuck, Craig, Stacy, Dave, Andrew. All it's doing inside of this function is printing out each item. I can also get an index out of there. Anyone know where to get the correct JSON schema for posting requests to discovery schedule? I have a CSV that I'm trying to automate discovery with. Chris, great question for the community. Go ahead and post that in the ITOM section and tag it with discovery or in the developer section, if you wish, and see if there's a, a response there. But you'll probably get more uh, expert eyes if you post that into the uh, discovery, uh, into the ITOM community. All right, so I've got individual elements out of list that I can print the item. So when you have an actual array, var array equals, and you denote this with square brackets, Let's do some different names this time. J, we'll take people right off the community. Carolyn and Paulo. And I want to build an array out of that. I've already got an array. No, I want to, what do I do with that? I'm trying to demonstrate the push operator. I got an idea. Let's first define my array. And I'm going to do this without a loop. I'm just going to say array.push is, and let's put in there j array.push is Carolyn and array.push hollow. Single quotes, double quotes, doesn't matter. So what I've done is take strings. Now you may acquire these through a glide record query and say, go find me all the active P1s and return the numbers. You would now have a number. In the case of this advanced reference qualifier, they're putting together perhaps strings or tables or something that makes that encoded query. So if I wanted to emulate a reference qualifier, I could say uh, name, in plus, I have an array. In fact, I know what that array looks like because I can say GS info array equals. Now, how do I go from array to a comma separated string? I say array dot join and whatever character I want. Now, if I had done two string, it will put in the commas for me but I may not necessarily want commas, as in the case of a reference qualifier. I may want new lines. I may want colons. I may want semicolons. I may want something else. So here's the one that does a two string, and here's the one that does the join. If I wish, I could take the join and say, you know what, for my debug statement, let's not do a two string and get the automatic commas in there. Let's get the automatic. Let's put spaces in there. Ooh, fancy. All right, so now I can see join is a lot more flexible than two string. Yes, two string will put the commas in there for you. It will work, but that doesn't solve this issue we're getting back to here, where you can see it again later. We're taking 
the title array returned. So we're creating an array. Here's the push operator, making a bunch of array names in a while loop. Or excuse me, making a bunch of array elements using get value. So I applaud the practice. That's good. But we have an array. They're converting the array to a string, then splitting it and turning it back into an array. And then printing it, which turns it back into a string. You see what just happened there? We went array to string to array to string. Tell me what happened. I don't know. And then we're returning an array to string to an array. Something tells me you don't want to return an array. You want to return a string. If it's an advanced reference qualifier, you almost always want to be returning something like this. So this outputs a string separated by whatever you choose, as we saw up here with spaces. This outputs it with a comma. It's much easier to read. You're operating on that specific type. So while it looks cool to start stringing things together, no pun intended, about doing a dot this and dot that, this is totally inappropriate because you're going array to string to array to string on that output and not to string where you need it on this. So think about that. If you, if you keep in mind, do I have a string or do I have an array? If I have a string, I can use split to turn it into an array. If I have an array and I need to turn it into a string, use join. If I'm creating this array, then push is a very common operation. There are others for inserting and taking out the splice and replace and Okay, I'll, I'll cover that when I get my other videos done. But for the time being, can keep in mind, do you have a string or do you have an array? If you've got an array and you need to convert it to a string, join. If you have a string and you need to convert it to an array, split. Split and join. Join and split. Okay, don't mix up where they go. Very, very handy. So I didn't mean to go off on such a rant on that, but I think it, this is the second time I've seen people converting to a string to an array in the wrong context. And pro potentially, if you're doing this on, say, an import set, you could be slowing down your import set considerably for no apparent reason. So if it's an, if it's an operation that's happening over and over and over again, then you've got something else to look at. Okay, that's my JavaScript operator's idea. I'm going to mark that as done. I also want to um, talk about the sysattachment doc table. Now, many of you are familiar with when you do a sysattachment. Let's go to my safety app. I don't have any safety P1 issues, so let's take that out. I don't need that anymore. Go to my safety app, and do I have any of these that are still open? <laughs> like to see something. So here's one, 1006. When you attach a file, let's choose a file. I have no idea what I've got available to choose on here. So let's just take this PNG file, put that there. This is not part of the incident record. It goes into a table called sysattachment. It's called sd.png. And I can get there by going to sysattachment.list. If I sort things by the date it was updated, Put that there, save that, and sort C to A, I get sd.png is here. However, this is not the complete story. This is metadata about that attachment. Some of the metadata. It tells you what record this is attached to. So there's a table name and a table sysid. In the case of the table, if it's an attachment field, a, like a, a, an image field or one of the attachment fields that we've got now, it will put zz underscore yy in front of the table name to say this goes with a field. There is no table in the system called zzyyscat item. All right. The field name becomes the file name and then that gets attached. So when I upload a profile picture to sysuser, there is a an image field. In fact, let's look for that. Equals zzyy underscore yy sys user. Okay, 
photo, photo, photo. The name of the field is photo, and here is the record this goes with. So if you have multiple image fields on a record, you can tell the photo field from the avatar field, from the evidence field, whatever, you, whatever your fields are called, they will all have the same table name, they will all have the same sysid. This is how the associations are made for a field and for a record attachment that we saw on the safety issue. So take that out and back to SDPNG. But again, that's only half the record. The reason I, I ran into this is because the Jeopardy game has an export utility. And I was exporting the sys attachment records, but they weren't showing up when I went to render them. And I realized, oh, wait a minute, there's a whole other table here. So if I take the sys ID of this record, if I preview this, it's just gonna download it. So I need that sys ID. I'm going to paste that over in here for a second. Just hover over that and it says, it ends with, I'm looking at the URL on the bottom, 9619FA. Is that what I got? 9619FA. Okay, good, got the right one. Now I go to sys attachment doc dot list and lo and behold, I have a big data field which holds what I'm thinking is a base 64 encoded field. I'm going to take that out because it just makes it hard to read and put in the sys attachment record <coughs> That is the first because it's a reference field. And I get, oh, let's also put in the date updated. Note, oh, look at this. There's no date updated. There's no mod count. There's no updated by. It just says created and created by. Interesting. Let's make that the first field. And if I look at when these things were created, I should see my SDPNG is the reference. There are two files here. One has a short length and one has a full length. Now that's what's in the data field. One is often a thumbnail. So when I upload an image, it's going to create a thumbnail for me. If I were to update a, uh, I don't know, XML file, no such luck. So these are the actual content files. You saw the base 64 encoded content in there. If I look at that, woohoo, not much to that. Doesn't look very exciting. So probably not much of a thumbnail, but if you are exporting sys attachment manually, make sure you also have the sys attachment underscore doc records that go along with it. It doesn't always work that way that you get those. If I were to go to sys attachment dot list again and do a show matching here and then export to XML, do, 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 export XML, I will get an XML file. And if I open that and say, there's a sys attachment file, there's no real content in here. You may have to look closely. I have seen, I don't know how this happened, if there's an option or something. At one point, there was a data field in here that contained the data and it had all of that encoded stuff. So watch for that. If you know how that got in there, let me know, because I don't. And then when I went to try a re-export, it wasn't there. So something was kind of kooky, nice feature, but I would rather have all of the sys attachment records and all the sys attachment doc records that go with them. Only then do you have the full content to make an image or a PDF or a Word document or whatever it is. You gotta have the content in both of those tables. Uh, Jay says, I ran into the attachment tables thing while archiving records with attachments. Yep, it's gonna happen if, you, if you're trying to do any sort of manipulation. Most of the time this stuff happens transparently, but to understand the table hierarchy and what those tables do when it comes to attachments is, is important when you start getting into development and what should I do and how do I copy this? And uh, I had another example of getting into that when I copied records, I was copying let's just say a sys user record. And I wanted to keep the image. I think it was actually when I was copying exam records. That's what it was on my exam manager that I did about five years ago. Uh, I was copying an exam and I wanted all the questions. I wanted all the answers. I wanted all everything. And many of them had images on them. Now they were often attached to an image field. So you had to do the ZZYY thing on the table. 
But to copy that to a new record, you could just reference the old image because that belonged to the other record. So I had to copy the sysattachment and sysattachment doc records, make sure those lined up so you had the right reference to sysattachment on the sysattachment doc record and the right reference on the sysattachment record to the parent record and field. So there's a, there's a tie-in when you're doing a UI action that says, hey, let's just go duplicate these records. It's not just the fields on the record, but it's also the data that goes behind that. Otherwise, you might as well just forget about attachments entirely. So it's up to you if you want to do attachments. Maybe that's even a good use for a property that says, copy attachments when I copy records. When you're, If you're making an, a, a functionality like that, put a property in there so people can choose. Do you want to copy attachments? Maybe it's not necessary in dev, but it is in production. So you could turn it on in dev, test it out, turn it off in dev, and you don't waste a whole lot of extra space. Your call. So that is my developer deep dive topic around arrays and the sysattachment. With that, I think it's uh, time to end the show. Let's uh, get signed out here. Thank you very much for joining me for the last hour or so. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. If you found something helpful, useful, you learned something, maybe even mildly humorous, go ahead and click that like button on YouTube. Appreciate it very much. It lets other people know that there's helpful information. If you're watching out the community, click the helpful button there and other people will know. Thank you very much. And I will see you again tomorrow. Take care.